Kyle? This is a bug in Bento I need to fix. Um, there's something that's working with sudo as well that looks like another pretty weird bug, actually. Uh, I need to look into that. I don't know why I, I haven't seen that when I was preparing the exercise. So I am sorry about the mix up. Um, If you don't do an in-place build, it does the same thing as Python setup.py build. It builds stuff, but you cannot import NumPy. You need after to do like the install. So do you do that with Bento or with? Well, it's both like, uh, like the build command in Bento and the build command in setup.py do the same thing. Oh, so I can use setup.py install and install. Well, there's an install command in Bento if you want to install it. So. So the in-place build allows you not, you don't have to install NumPy to use the one you just built. That's the main point. But if that doesn't work, what's the alternative? Uh, if we don't do it in place, what do we need to change if we want to build over and over again? Uh, then you need to install it every time. Sorry? If uh, you don't use the in-place build, yeah. you need to install it every time. Every time you change something, you need to install okay. to get the new version. That's why. It, when you're developing with NumPy, it's not so convenient. How do you install? Well, just so with this, you see this Python setup.py install, and with Bento, it's the same Bento maker install. Well, then there's the usual semantics of these two things. Like, if you're inside the virtual env, it will install inside the virtual env. If you pass the um, user dash dash user it will install into your home directory. And if you don't do that, then it will install globally, and you most likely need sudo to do that. Oh. Generally, especially when you develop a new uh, package, it's a very bad idea to install with sudo. Like, I mean, I, I never do that myself. Like, it's the best way to screw things up. But uh, generally, what I advise is to just use the virtual end, so you can just remove the virtual end when you're done. And you don't, you're not missing up with anything. Uh, but, well, I mean, like preferences, but that's the way I do it. Uh, works pretty well. I can explain a bit, but uh, yeah, if you're not used to it, may I'm not sure how useful it is. Uh, yeah, I kind of assumed everybody knew about Vitron. Um, so, do you know the principle of Vitron? Or no? Yeah, okay. So, I, it's actually a very stupid thing. I mean, it just when you call virtual env, you call it in a directory like, uh, I don't know, yo-yo. And what it does, it just copies a few files into the directory yo-yo. So just get this command. And then you do source yo-yo bin activate. Oh, sorry. Whoop, whoop. And once you do that, you see the yo-yo here. And it means that at that point, when you launch the Python, you see that the Python you're having is not the global one. It's the one inside virtual end. So at that point, everything you do, when you do an install, all these kind of things, you will not install globally. You will install everything in YoYo. And when you're done, you can just remove YoYo and you're done. So I don't have virtual end. Okay. Yeah, that's a separate. It's not part of the standard library of Python. That's a separate package you need to install. Okay. Um, yep. You, you said you changed something to um, the picture <coughs> with the unused brand. But do we change it inside build or do we change the actual. Uh, so you need to change uh, the file in the source tree. Yeah. So inside NumPy, so Lap, Lapac Lite, the example given, is a good example because it's a small file. Okay. Okay. Mm. There should be a user install. Oh, no, to install no, no, install the package. Itself. The Bento package. The Bento package. Oh, the Bento package itself? Right. That's why we were trying to install by Studio.
Um, I mean, I just uh, specified my local prefix manually. Yeah, is it? Yeah. It's a very common option. The dash dash user option should be recognized by the default. Yeah, that's why I'm surprised. Like, all zeros and one are there, it's but not, not like something you would have to add manually. Yeah. Now, admittedly, like, I think it's mostly a set of tools and distribute. Yeah, I, I guess it depends on what version. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure why the user information doesn't appear here. That's weird. Yeah, I need to look into that. Yeah. So just the last thing before going to the next stage I wanted to show was uh, group. So even so, as you notice, like Bendo is a bit less stable than these tutils for some things at least. Um, for development, he has a few useful things. Like, so if you build with um, like warnings, with these tutils, it's pretty verbose. So it can be a bit hard to look into like the different, um, or to just look at the actual information compared to the noise. And you have the iPhone P option in build, which instead of like, it just shows a it just shows an um, actual warning, and it doesn't show anything else. So it make it easier to pick up what is um, what is a compilation warning and maybe errors if you have some errors. So the difference with the distributed build here is you only see the warnings, you don't see any other output. With the iPhone P option, you just see, you just see um, what's the output of the compiler, basically. You don't see any output of Bento itself, you just see the output of the compiler, which makes it a bit easier to, cat, uh, to catch up um, whatever warnings or errors you need to fix. Okay. Is there any other question? Or? No? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, so now you can build NumPy, uh, but that's not very interesting because you want to actually fix something or you want to modify it. Um, so one of the issues with NumPy, and that's not really specific to NumPy, like to any large C extension to Python, is you have the layer between Python and C, which makes it hard to like understand what's going on. It's hard because you don't have like good tools today that really allows you to seamlessly go between Python and C. So let's say you run, let's say you have a sec fault inside NumPy. So sure, you can use GDB, and run GDB and get a backtrace. But the issue is, like, GDB only knows about the C level. It doesn't know about the Python level very much. So from GDB, you will not be able to see the Python function calls. You will only see the C function calls. And today, there's just no nice solution that really gives you a seamless, like, you do see the difference between Python and C. So in this section, I will first try to explain a bit like the different parts of NumPy, what is where, so you get like a more precise idea where is the layering between C and Python happening. And then I give a few tricks. It's, it's not really like, it's more like hacks, like to find your way sometimes when you have no idea. You're in Python, you're like, I know the errors is in C, but I have no idea where, because I don't even know which function is called. Because sometimes when you're at the Python level, it's not obvious what is a C function called what is your entry point, and how do you fix the C part of your code base? So we show like kind of two ways of doing it. Like one is a, like kind of principled way. Like if you know enough about Python and how it works, you can find your way most of the time. And then I show a few tricks that allows you to find your way even if you don't know exactly uh, how some parts of Python C interface is working. So a bit about the Python source code organization. So once you have a checkout of NumPy, you have like several subdirectories. You have numpy slash core. That's where most of NumPy is happening. That's certainly where most like maybe 90% of the C code base that's in numpy slash core. So like broadcasting, the array object, the dtype, the ufunc, 
that's all implemented in NumPy slash call. So you have the call for the multi-array extension, that's what implements the array object. You have the ufunk extension, and you have like a few support libraries as well. Some of the um, parts which like kind of are important but are much simpler. You have NumPy slash lib, so Stefan before showed like um, the um, stride tricks functions it's inside NumPy uh, lib. They are very, very little C code here, it's mostly Python. Then you have NumPy FFT, NumPy Linux for the algebra, <coughs> and NumPy random. Those, again, are much simpler because it's mostly like scientific algorithms, and the Python C interface is pretty straightforward. So basically, I, I will not speak about that at all for the rest of the training. If you need to fix a bug in FFT or Linux, Linux or random, it's actually pretty simple to do from the pure programming point of view. It may be tricky from like the algorithmic engineering point of view, but from purely like fixing the C code, but pretty easy. The hard stuff is in the Python core. So one of the first thing you have in the NumPy source code is um, one of the first thing being built actually is N NPI mass. So NPI mass is a very thin wrapper around. Um, it gives it tries to give um, C ninety nine compatible mass API. So here the big issue of course is Windows. Like the standard library for mathematics is completely broken on Windows. So we need to implement pretty much everything. And the idea is to give something that kind of looks like most same platforms, and we implement all the functionalities on Windows to make it look as if it were uh, an actually working platform. So some of the things we are implementing is like the isNAN. So if you have a floating point, which is not a number, like the backcode to find out if it's a NAN or not, it will be implemented inside NP, NPI is and we have the same thing for all of the kind of low-level floating point things. The key point here is you have the NPI underscore. So if you use the NPI underscore something inside of your code base, you're guaranteed to get the function that will, be, will, that will behave the same, hopefully, on every platform. Whether you're on Windows, on Mac, on Linux, you will get the behavior that is defined in the standard. NPM mass has a, like a small half float implementation. So it's like a non-standard float, which is like only two bytes. It's of course a software implementation. We have all the basic arithmetic operation. So I believe it's useful for people to like, um, uh, like in computer vision, some people use that. I'm not so familiar with that part of the code. But if you need to look into something related to the low level implementation of half float, but in NPI mass as well. So, yeah, question? So on, on Linux and Mac, it's just like a wrapper? Yeah. Thin wrapper. yeah. But even on Linux and Mac, you need to use a wrapper. This way, your code will behave the same on everything. But I mean, really, like, the main point to remember from this slide is, like, when you need to use mass operation inside um, uh, your code, use NPI prefix. So the NPI mass is pretty simple because it's just low-level C function. You don't have much Python at all. Um, you have some like documentation. If you look at the header, you look at all the functions defined, basically. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's what you have today as a documentation. Since a function like just mimics C99, to actually look at the behavior, you just look into the C99 standards. So here you just have a very trivial example on how to use these functions uh, inside uh, your own C extension. The header to include is numpy slash npi mass. And then you just use npi x inside your function, and you get back the standard compliant exponential function. Right inside the NumPy folder, I'm finding it in source and NPI, 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 NPI,
side. Um, question about how the source is organized. Yep. Some, some functions are, are named like low level strategy.c.source. Yep. So, like NumPy is implemented in C, like pure C, is, and so you don't really have a templating system in C like you have in C. So, it has a kind of workaround for that. We have like kind of hackish templating system where, like, when you build NumPy, what happens is you have some small Python templating engine that converts the .c.src into the .c. Inside the .c.src, you have, well, I can show a small example actually. Yeah, I um, need to ray. So you have you have an example here where um, you have this like small macro but specific to the um, competing engine, and you say like you have a type with um, you want like to have to generate this function for two different types here long and long long, and so then you have like the variable inside like arrow bases and all these get expanded. This function is written twice during the build. Once with type replaced by long, and once with uh, type replaced by long. So when you need to fix that code, you need to fix a dot c dot src. But what's being built, of course, is actually the dot c. Uh, by what the compiler says is a dot c. So like it like it's like if the warning appears only in some cases of the templates, right. then you need like to split the templates and to fix only like for for the type that gives the warning and like keep it as before for the type that doesn't give the warning. Another question? Okay, so. So why do you uh, not use C++? Uh, my opinion is that it's a horrible language, but the reality is that because um, NumPy was developed like 15 years ago, and uh, like C, a C com you have a like C compiler much more often than C++ compiler, especially 15 years ago. Like most C++ compilers didn't work very well compared to today. That, that's uh, sort of a side question, but that, um, how much of the code that's uh, NumPy is actually the previous So it was. Oh yeah, sure. So the question was. Um, so NumPy didn't start from scratch. It's like kind of a merge between like two different projects called NumArray and Numeric, and the question was how much of the code today in NumPy is coming from number and numeric? And my answer is short is I don't know, <laughs> because I've been contributing to NumPy mostly once the merge was happening. Um, Travis would know much better. Uh, like in NumPy slash lib, you have actually some compatible layer to still work with numarray and maybe numeric, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Okay, so now looking into um, okay, it's nice to have like the C ninety nine compatible mathematical functions, but that's not so interesting when you're inside NumPy. So it's interesting when you when you're inside NumPy is you have the array object, you have the D types, you have all these kind of things. And that's what we look into uh, now. So 
maybe the most important structure is the pi array object. So pi array object is a C structure that contains every time you have an instance of a numpy array in Python, underlying you have one pi array object uh, structure. So here I just, well, you can look into the numpy source code to look into it. But like the actual content is pretty simple actually. You have the pointer data, so just a class pointer. This points towards what's the actual memory buffer. So that's <coughs> trying to look at the actual data inside the numpy array, that's inside the data member of the pi array object structure. ND is a number of dimension. So if you have a two-dimensional array, you have like ND equal to two, one-dimensional array, ND equal to one. And then you have like an array of integer dimensions, which has as many items as you have dimensions. And for each dimension, we give you how many items you have in that dimension. So if you have a three by two arrays, well, dimension zero will be three, dimension one will be two. So it's just like the same thing as um, the attribute as a Python level. If you look into Python, you have a NumPy array object. Well, the data are coming from this data structure in C, the dimensions. Stride, that's what Stefan explained before. That's just the actual data again are in C. So when you look into Python at the Python level, you look into the strides. Well, it's just pointing out to the strides pointer inside the Py array object structure. Py array uh, underscore desk, that's a pointer towards the D type, the C representation of the D type. So I will talk more about that later. Um, flags and weak ref list, but it's less important. We kind of ignore that for now. <clears throat> so for every NumPy array, you have a corresponding um, Py array object underlying. What's the base pointer? So this uh, is used when you have views. One of the reasons is when you have views. It's it's yes, numpy and the array object dot h. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe they changed recently. Sorry, it's and the array type dot h. Yeah, actually, I simplified the code because in recent NumPy, they kind of started changing um, how it's like wrapped. Because um, that's kind of like historical baggage from numeric num array. All the structures I'm showing here. Sorry, I'm going back to the. All this is inside the header, which means like every time. You don't include every source file will see the definition of this trick, which is not very good design. Um, so what we are trying to do now is to change the NumPy source code to kind of hide the implementation detail. So morally speaking, that's still what you have. That's why I simplified a bit the code here. If you look into array types.h in the actual NumPy source tree, we get something a bit different with a tag and like some kind of wrapping around. Um, but that's not really important for the idea, so I kind of simplified it here. But that's why it looks a bit different. Quick, yeah? Quick question about that, um, with the uh, move towards hiding some of that implementation detail, how is that going to impact, uh, some, like there's some, some really nice things how I can just simply pass the C pointer to Blast or uh, Atlas or something, and it, it'll still work. Yep. Uh, with hiding a lot of those implementation details, is that still going to be an issue? Is that going to become an issue, or is there still plan to somehow still be able to put out a C pointer that will? So, I, the notion of keeping the pointer you can give to like C or Fortran libraries, this I think will, well, I don't want to say never, but it's so critical to what NumPy does that this will not disappear anytime soon. Um, but by hiding, I'm like, so one of the issues we're having today with NumPy is because all this is in the header. As soon as you include that into your C source code, you become dependent on the binary representation of this structure, 
So if like in NumPy in 1.8, we decide, oh, maybe data come after ND, then everything breaks. You break the ABI. So that's what we mean by like hiding the implementation data. It's like you have just one pointer, the structure is defined in the C code, you still have functions that will give you back, for example, like car star data. You'll still have like functions to give you back the dimension and everything. But because you get it from a function instead of the structure, then you can change the memory layout representation without breaking everything that built against this version. That, that's possible to do? Well, that's what, I mean, yeah, that's what you get well, naturally, yeah. But well, the only reason why it works is because if the structure is inside your C code, which is not exposed in the header, then the function that gives you back data or ND, they live in the same C file, so they're always in sync. So you cannot have the change of memory layout because they're all in the same .o. So that's why you don't have this issue. But today what happens is we have a lot of issues where some people, they have an old C extension, the API has not changed at all, but it's very easy to break the ABI because you change maybe a bit the layout without making, just not paying attention, and then you break everything. And that's kind of an issue today, one of the issues with NumPy development. But you still, all the features that make it easy to get a NumPy array data into a Fortran C library, this, again, will not disappear anytime soon because that's, that's one of the main reasons that made NumPy successful, so this will stay there. Yeah. So it sounds like a good plan. The question is, um, sometimes these things get a little bit out of hand. Like, if you look at the old XML like, and source code, mm -hmm. you're trying to build a object system to see. Yep. And I, I just felt like it got fully totally maintainable. You're trying to do something good, but the implementation got really good. So well, like, one of the issues is that NumPy like, really built by accretion, kind of. Well, in particular, like, if you're trying to overcome some of C's deficiencies. Well, you have the same issue in C++. What's that? This issue exists in C++ as well. I'm, I'm aware of that, but I think the pilot would be better than Well, but not for this issue, at least. Uh, in C++, you have the same issue. Like in Qt, they do exactly the same thing. They have one private pointer, and they use a, what's called the pinpoint idiom, and they put all the implementation in the C file for the same reason. In C++, another reason is because compilation is so slow. So, like, they hide the implementation of the C file, or C++. Okay. And um, so this issue doesn't disappear with C++, actually. Uh, <laughs> but that's true that it's just a limitation of the C++ C++ memory model. If you were developing in some more modern languages, we wouldn't have this issue. But, uh, um, but that's true, like, a lot of the C, I invest one of the reasons to give this tutorial is when you start with NumPy code base, it's not as nice as, I don't know, uh, I don't have a good example of a good C library, but well, actually the free BSD C library is pretty good. Uh, it's pretty readable. Um, a lot of the C99 implementation is coming from the free BSD library. This is pretty readable. Um, well, it's just a matter of you know, people taking time. It's just the usual maintenance issue. Like people prefer implementing new features or fixing bugs that just making the code cleaner. Um, but hopefully some of you at the end of the tutorial will want to do that. Uh, so, um, there are efforts being done to do that. It's just, well, it's just a lot of manpower that needs to be uh, spent on that. Okay, so we have the PyArray object um, that represents the main data of an array. And then there is a PyArray desk that represents a D-type representation. So, depending on which kind of D-type you're looking at, um, the P array desk can be complex or not. So every time you create a new D-type, if you do like, give me back a new D-type for float eight bytes, you will get back a new P array desk instance. So that we could here are pretty obvious. They just map one to one to the Python one. Like if you want to see what is the size of one item, what is alignment, is it byte swapped or not, this is pretty simple. Server array, let's use when you have a structured D-type. So when you have a D-type that is a component of multiple atomic types, let's implement it through like server array. Fill the name that's actually for structured D-type. So again, when you have a D-type where you have like two fields with names, 
So in the SVB, put in the name here, and the actual detail type corresponding to that name are put in here. The meat of the D-type is really the tri array of Pops pointer. So this is actually an array of function pointers, and pretty much all the D-type implementation is happening through uh, this function pointer. So like, the, like we have a D-type for integer and a D-type for float, where they will have a completely different array of function pointers, which points to different functions that are specific to the types. So one example would be like, okay, I have one item. How do you swap it? Like to change the Indianness? Well, it depends on the type. Well, at least, yeah, depends on the type. So you will have like different function depending on which D type you want. So if you look into the pi array of data structure, again, inside the NumPy uh, headers, you will see all the different functions you can define for D type. So this part is a bit ugly because um, some of them need to be defined and some don't. Um, and the documentation is not always accurate. So um, we'll try to look into some of that uh, later. But uh, here, really, like your main method is trial and error. Um, it's not as good as it could be here. So that's definitely the dark corner of uh, D type is pretty much a dark corner in time of the C implementation. And um, like which function you need to be defined, which you don't. Um, well, you really want to have a debugger with you. So the two main data structure are pi array object and pi array desk. Pi array object is useful to know because if you want to debug some algorithms inside recent version of DDB, they know enough about Python that if you know you have a pointer to a pi array object, once you're inside GDB, well, you can access to the data pointer and kind of look at the data inside. So that's useful. D-type, that will be mostly useful when we look into like implementing your own D-type. But really, like, if there's one thing you need to know to really find your way into like the Python C layer, that's actually a different structure. And that's this one. That's the pi array underscore type. And this one is not a pi object. This is a pi type object. So pi type object is the C API to define a um, new type extension. So that is, if you want to define a new class, for example, dict in Python or list, well, most of the implementation for that is in C for efficiency reason inside the Python runtime. And this is implemented through like P type object. So this, you don't have one such structure for each NumPy array you have. You just have, a, if that's a single term inside the NumPy one time. So why is this interesting? It's interesting because most, not all, but like, yeah, most of the Python C layering is happening here. If you understand this data structure, and understand its behavior, you can guess correctly maybe 80% of the time which function will be called when you do uh, when you call something in Python with NumPy array. So the way type extension works in Python, that's not specific to NumPy, it's just a PyType object. So here you see the historic baggage of Python a bit as well. But basically you have like direct functions here. So IRA web. Let's use the implementation of rep on an empire web. So if you see is that for some reason there is a bug in the rep function of an empire array, at the Python level, well, this is actually happening inside every web. Same for SDR. Now a bit more complex is what's happening when you do A plus A, you have two empire arrays, you have A plus A. Let's say you have a, your custom D type and you do A plus A and maybe Segforce, maybe it doesn't do at all what you want. But the problem is you don't really know, okay, A plus A, where, where is the entry point in C? Well, plus, it's actually the number of protocol in Python. So that's a Python thing, that's not specific to NumPy. When you do a plus operation between two numbers, that's what Python calls a number of protocol because a plus is translating into un underscore, underscore, add, underscore, underscore. 
And that's part of the so-called like number protocol. Inside of like a type extension, protocols are implemented through an uh, array of function functions. So array as number is not a function, but it's an array of function. And that array of function will have an implementation for array add, array sub, etc. for the first. And so if you look into the Python, not NumPy, but the Python documentation, this is pretty well defined. It tells you the number protocol that's this list of function. This is at Python level. This is at the C level. And that's how every type extension in C should be implemented uh, to work with Python. So number protocol is every time you have basic arithmetic operation, plus, minus, multiplication, division, all this happens through the array as number um, protocol once you go into C. So when you do A plus A in NumPy, and you do a break inside, so not array as number, but inside the array underscore add, well, it will be pretty high at the C level, just after you go from Python to C, and then you can start like stepping into the code to understand what's going on. And then for all the other protocols, that's the same. When you do indexing, that's the sequence protocol, Again, that's well-defined Python. They will tell you all the slicing, syntax, all these kind of things, how it translates into like magic function in Python. And those magic function in Python, they are implemented in C for NumPy arrays, but it's in the array as sequence. You have the mapping protocol, like for like dictionary-like behavior. Same if it's array as mapping. Iterator protocol, same array underscore iter. And then all like the normal methods, like let's say, um, sum, when you end numpy.sum an array, that's actually one method into numpy, and they're defined in here. So that's a method of the class numpy array. And so when I say like one of the ways to find your way into numpy is like kind of to understand the basic C Python layer, uh, how does it, how that works? The principal way is this way. For most of the things, you go through the Py array type. And pretty much all the operation with NumPy array, it goes through one of the functions in here. So if you understand this here, then you can start either in a debugger or depending on the issue you're, doing, you're trying to solve, this is some printf, but at least you know which function are called, and you can start from there. Yep. So like array as number, or well, we can look into it actually. That's an array of multiple functions. Um, Actually, oh no, of course. So, here we go. So this one is actually almost intuitive. It's in the number.c file. All the number protocol for NumPy is implemented in the number C file inside uh, the multi-array source tree. And you can see here, Array as number array. And it's just an array of functions. Add, subtract, multiply. And I think for the number of protocol, I wouldn't be surprised if he implements 100% of the protocol. And that's what I mentioned before when you do A plus A. It's actually calling array add. Or you can try that easily in GDB if you're familiar with GDB. You have a simple script, you have an empire array, you do A plus A, you do a break array add, well, you will see that as soon as you do A plus A, at some point you will get, if you break there, then once you reach that point, you do a backtrace, you can see all the core since there. Can you maybe do that? Yes, that's actually, I was thinking it would be a good idea to show. Thank you. Um, so, test add, oh, add. Oops, sorry. 
there is an exercise after to, to do this, but just to give an idea of how it looks. So maybe before coming here, some of you at least had no idea what's happening here when you A plus A. If I ask you, okay, what is the C function that does an A plus A implementation? Maybe at least some of you didn't know. And let's say, hopefully it's unlikely, there is a bug in the addition in NumPy arrays, but let's say there is a bug and you want to fix it, but you don't know, you don't, you don't know where to start. So here, I'll explain a bit more about GDB later, but it's yeah, just a very minimum. I launched with GDB Python, which means GDB is a debugger, and Python, well, because I want to debug the Python process. So now I break at array underscore add. So I know it's array add because what I explained before with the py array type extension, I know that addition is part of the number protocol, and when I go into the number protocol implementation for arrays, I know it's array add. Let me start from the start. GDB Python. <coughs> then break array add. So here you have an issue because I just launched Python at that point. Well, actually, I haven't studied Python, but GDB looks into all the symbols of Python. So you can see here. The problem is at that point, obviously, GDB doesn't know at all that you have NumPy. So when you do this, you have a message that shouldn't scare you. It says, function array add is not defined. The reason is because you haven't imported NumPy, so the C runtime is not importing to NumPy, so GDB doesn't see the symbol array add yet. And now I forgot how I call my, phone, my script. Um, yeah, thank you. Oops. Oh yeah, of course I. Well, I cleaned my NumPy tree before. So yeah, you need NumPy to be built to debug it. So if you, well, you can run it anywhere as long as you can import NumPy from Python. So if it's an in-place build, it needs to be into the source tree. If you install it, then it can be from anywhere. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry, okay, I misunderstood your question. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not sure, but I would guess, I don't know if anybody knows better, I would guess it's mostly like historical baggage when Python started. Like maybe at first they had a structure with a fixed size, but then after they needed to extend that while keeping ABI and API compatibility, so maybe after they put like pointers of pointers to just keep the structure the same size. That would be my guess, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and if you want to know exactly which one are functions and which one are array of functions pointers, then you need to look into the C API documentation of uh, Python, uh, the C API documentation. And there's, there's no specific reason why some it just one function and some are, some are obvious, like STR, there's just one function. So number protocol, there's a lot of functions. But why iteration is just one function, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe they want to keep space for later extension. I'm not sure. So hopefully now I can import NumPy. OK. So I restart as before. Break array add. Is there a way to have GDB remember the string from previous sessions? If you know, I would be happy to know, and because it drives me nuts as well. Well, you have a Python API on GDB. No, if you, yeah, GDB is pretty ancient, but. So, at least here we have something kind of remotely interesting. I launched GDB Python. 
I want a breakpoint on array add. I run my simple script, simple add. And here, hey, success. I broke here. And I can see, so that's the point of building with the debug Python, is you know exactly which file and even which line. And you get, like, So, let's. Um, if you inside the source tree, if it doesn't give you an error, it will be because it's importing the one from the source tree because by default Python will first look into your current directory. And if you want to make sure, let me open a different. Let's say you have no idea where this NumPy is coming from. You can just do that. And here you know it's not an absolute pass, it's a relative pass. It shows you that it's a NumPy which is in the source tree. And this is not specific to NumPy, this works for any Python packages. Yep? So, like there are two ways. The first way is what I was trying to explain, like the principal way, like to understand when you have A plus A, that's a number protocol. And I explained the number protocol is as a pipe type extension. And then you go from there. Um, maybe you're lazy or maybe you just don't understand because sometimes it's not as obvious. So I wish you later like some trick you can use that often works but don't always work. Um, and then you have like some very platform specific tools that can help. So one of the issues is um, you'd really like to be able to break on any function call. So this I learned recently that's actually impossible to do efficiently in a debugger. Um, at least on normal CPU. So some of the tools that can help you is like Dtrace. So Dtrace if you're like, okay, Solaris or Mac OS X. Then you can insert dynamic probe point at any time and then you can get like very useful information. Like with a simple Dtrace script on Mac OS X, you can get a dynamic call trace, like top, instead of showing you the uh, process, it shows you all the function called in real time. And with a, like you can do that after launching the original process. A much clunkier way is to use Valgrind, and I will show how to do that. It shows, it works well enough that it's useful, but sometimes it doesn't. Sure. Uh, yeah, so you need to you need to build with uh, debug Python. Yeah. Otherwise, you will get something. It will still break at the right point, but you will not get all this useful information. So to clean, you just remove the build tree, and you can use uh, git clean. I can show you after, it's easier to, uh, uh, it's not very practical to explain. Uh, one. So the last thing I wanted to show here before the break, I mean, I'm sure story at break, is when you're here, if you're not so used to GDB, it may not look very useful. It's actually very useful because <laughs> you have the function name here, <coughs> but okay, we started from the function name, so not so. But what is interesting here, we have like two pointers. In array add, we know that if you look into the definition of array add at the C level, it takes two pi array object pointer. So you know like these two objects are pi array pointer. So if you do something like <coughs> because I did A plus A. So let's see if I remember that right. Will this work? No. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. Sorry. Get. So here, like, so P just a small thing to say print. 
So print M1, that's the first argument of the array add. So that's a pointer to the pi array object data structure I showed before. So this, I'm not sure it still works now. Yeah. So this used to work, but doesn't anymore because of all the wrapping I explained before. And now I don't remember offhand how is the new API. So I will look into the break for that. Um, yeah, but yeah, do you remember? This, this time, uh, no, I don't remember. Yeah, okay. So but I think it's time to maybe to, to, yeah. to give a break. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, maybe we can first start with the. Yeah. So half, uh, well, 25 minutes break, and then we can restart uh, 10 uh, 35, something like this.